Daniel chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. It pleased Darius, who is the king of Babylonia, to appoint 120 satraps. What are satraps? Governors of provinces, just in case you were wondering. 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators. How many administrators? They oversee who? The satraps. Interesting term. With three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. What was Daniel's position? He was an administrator. One of how many? Three. Just want to make sure you're following. <laughs> the satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now, how important is it to select good leaders? Amen. And what was the purpose be, be behind this selection? Is so that the king, as well as the kingdom, would not suffer loss. Are you following me so far? Now, Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators. How many administrators? Three. Three. You're on it. He so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities. What kind of qualities? Exceptional. exceptional. The King James Version may use a different term, but I think it's the same. By his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. What part of the kingdom? The whole. All of it. All of it. Now isn't that distinguishable? Now, isn't that exceptional? How important is it to distinguish ourselves? How important is it for us to be committed to being exceptional at our calling? Amen? Amen. One of the gifts of the Spirit, as Steve talked about this morning, is the gift of administration given by the Holy Spirit. So here Daniel is quite gifted in what God has called him to do. That he has distinguished himself, but it's God who distinguishes him. Amen. In addition to that, he is exceptional at his calling. At this, the administrators and the satraps try to find grounds for charges against him. What is one of the dangers of being so exceptional and so distinguishable? Is that the devil doesn't like it. People don't like it. Why do I bring in the devil at this point? Because you are a threat to him when you have strong conviction, when you are living at a high level of principle and morality. Are you listening to me this morning? Amen. Amen? How many of you want to be distinguishable in your calling? How many of you want to be exceptional in your calling? Amen? May this encourage you to pursue that very goal in your own personal life, your own per, uh, personal profession. Uh, Amen? Amen? So they try to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. Huh. Well, we've got to find something. There's got, there's got to be a skeleton in this person's closet. Something that we can drug up and expose for everybody to see and then somehow to then discredit him, to marginalize him, to demote him. How many of you know the devil desires to demote you? But the only way that he is able to do that is that there needs to be charges brought forth. Now, Jesus himself says the devil has nothing on me. Amen? Amen? So at that point, you give the devil no leverage. You give the devil no accusation. And so therefore, if you take those things away, then they have to try really hard to drum up something to the degree that they now have to lie about it. Mm-hmm. Or to somehow swindle. Or to outsmart. And so, being as schemy 
as they are, and being very demonically tactful, they have determined to come up with a plan, and the way that they're going to approach this is by stroking the ego of the king. Now, let me also make a point to say that, you know, Satan also attempted this with Jesus. He tried to appease the ego of the Son of God. He said to Jesus in the wilderness, if you are the Son of God, then you can turn these stones into bread. You are a person of position, of power, of ability, supernatural ability, actually. But the wonderful part is that the Lord gave us truly an example of how we should approach such things. Do not allow the enemy to appease, to pamper, to pet your ego. And what did he say? For it is written, that man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Jesus had placed himself in submission to what? The word of God. Don't stroke my evil. Take, take, your, take your words. Be gone from me, devil. But with King Darius, he had no such reference. So you think we should do what? For what purpose? To glorify me? Sure, great idea. Let's do that. And this is their scheme. At this, the administrators and the state traps try to find grounds for charges against Daniel. Look, notice here, there is a number, 120 if you will, plus the two other administrators who are now conspiring against this man of God. 120 plus two, that's a number of different minds that can come up with some creative ideas on how we can bring this person down. Does that sound familiar to you with regards to contemporary politics. At this, the administrators and the state traps try to find against Daniel's conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. And then again, he had given them no leverage. They could find no corruption in him. Oh, I love Can you imagine having a politician who has no corruption? <laughs> Boy! Wouldn't that be grand? Amen? And we know that Jesus, when he rules the earth during the millennial reign, he will be the epitome of a king who has no corruption. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? I look forward to the day when he is reigning and ruling over the earth. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy. Now there's a character trait. Can people trust you? Is your word your bond? If you say something to me, can I go to the bank with it? Can I cash that proverbial metaphorical check because you said it? Amen? And neither corrupt nor negligent. Here is Daniel who crosses his T's and dots his I's and cares very earnestly with regards to his personal reputation, his conduct, his character. This, I believe, should be an encouragement to the rest of us that we operate with the same type of conviction and personal reverence, godly reverence, biblical reverence, when we are operating in a world of evil. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges. Huh. I pray that's true for each and every one of us. Yeah. But because of the fall, I know that we have probably fallen short from that. But it doesn't mean that we can't now commit to it. Amen? As we aspire to walk in integrity. A man who walks in integrity, blessed is the man who walks in integrity. The man who walks in integrity walks secure. You believe that's true? The man who walks with integrity walks secure. And that's
that's the desire. When you are a person of conviction, of good character, that you can sleep at night. Yeah. If you are a person of good character and integrity, you don't have to look to see who's watching. If you are a person of good character and integrity, You are consistent with how you live your life in public as well as private. True? We will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So the conspiracy begins. So these administrators and same traps went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed. So now we've included more conspirators. Are you capturing that? So let me repeat that again. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days except to you, King Darius, your majesty shall be thrown... Let me read that again. I think I missed something. <laughs> your majesty shall be thrown... Yeah, it's very important that you use the proper punctuation when reading this. <laughs> thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty issued a decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. You see what they're doing here? Let me tell you something about Daniel. Under Nebuchadnezzar, he was well liked. They challenged him. They tested him. In addition to the other Jewish brothers, if you will, not biological brothers, but brothers by faith and by nation. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. When they stood their ground and they held to their convictions and they gave glory to God as to why they were saved from the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar praised the God of Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. This is what happens when you take a stand for what is right. This is what happens when you verbalize your commitment to God and shift all glory to Him when great things happen. That others who see the good works, they don't worship you, they worship Him. Amen? And praise Him and give Him all the glory. So, so King Darius put the decree in writing. Now it cannot be repealed. Now understand, Darius liked Daniel, or he would not have had him as one of the administrators, or would have considered him to basically uh, take charge over the entire kingdom. He was not familiar with the fact that these men were setting him up. Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room, where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day. How many times? Three. He got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying. That's quite an audience, amen? And asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being, except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? Now here's something that's important to notice. He will be thrown into the lion's den for praying. I've got to keep them from praying. 
Satan knows that there is power behind prayer. Satan knows that God speaks to his people in prayer. Satan knows that God imparts insight and foresight to his people. And Daniel was notorious for receiving from the Lord foresight as well as insight. And he was a gifted man. Early on in the, uh, in the book of Daniel, it says that God, that God had imparted knowledge and understanding to Daniel and the other Jewish brothers. So wisdom and knowledge and understanding comes from God Almighty. The very reason why he was distinguished, the very reason why he had success, the very reason why he was seen as a person who was trustworthy and I would be without threat of the, uh, given the, the, the confidence that I could put this man in charge of my entire kingdom and he would be a success at it because he was exceptional. There's only one reason because this man was committed to the Lord and he was praying three times a day. Prayer. When you become a leader and you are a man or a woman of strong character, do you know that you are a threat to the enemy? But if you are one who compromises your personal standards of living and you're living for the world, the devil would like to encourage that more than anything. Why? Because you're, you're not going to be powerful. Because you're a compromiser. The desire for all of us is to make a commitment to Christ, to make a commitment to his standards. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. And with that comes blessing. Why? Because there is a natural order that when you do certain things a certain way, then God, by natural universal order, has already commanded the blessing. Amen? Amen. <coughs> and so we see here, here, Daniel is placed in a very prominent position because he honors God. And any of us who have made prayer a significant part of our lives have had moments where God has imparted this glorious insight, spiritual insight. Even concerning our careers or our jobs, there are times that God will impart certain understanding and knowledge and wisdom to what we do. How many of you have at times have tried to fix something and you come to a point where it's like, you know, I can't, I can't figure this out. Yep. Amen? Amen. And then you stop and you, you think to yourself, you know, maybe something as simple as this, maybe I should just go ahead and go to the, to the throne about it. Lord, I can't figure this out. And then there are times where I've experienced God point something out. And then I begin to mess with it. And then it works. Or the Lord may sometimes put on our minds, hey, you know, so-and-so needs a job. Why don't you have them come over here and work on this? You pay it. Better yet. Mm -hmm. And so, if we listen, I can remember one specific time, and again, this is, this is just an example. I was at home, I was looking everywhere for my wallet. Everywhere. And I thought to myself, I've got my passport card in there, I've got my driver's license, I've got my credit cards in there, and I was thinking to myself, I think I even had some cash in there. Oh, that's not good. You ever had that happen? And you know, when I was looking for it, I looked everywhere. I went outside, maybe I sat at the table, was enjoying just a, a, a moment of peace out there, and I looked, no, it's not there. I went to my office, looking at it, no, not there. Went to the living room, I mean, I go to a number of different places uh, in my house. Went to the restroom, not there. He's uh -huh. gone. <laughs> no way. And so then I prayed, Lord, I have no idea where this wallet's at. But you know, you know where it's at. I probably should have went there first rather than exerting all this time and energy and work. And you know, here's what the Lord showed me. My wallet at night was sitting out here in the parking lot on the street. Wow. That's why I saw it. I thought, nah. I came here. Saw it right there, out in the street. It was black with the night. Picked it up, 
Thank you, Jesus. Amen? I mean, this is what God does. Praise the Lord. So he cares about the little things. For me, it was a big thing. But God is already present. He could be anywhere at any time imparting wisdom, knowledge, and truth to his people. And insight. And foresight. Are you hearing me this morning? Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upper stairs room where the windows opened for Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So he went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, it would embrace any God or human being except you? Your majesty would be thrown into the lion's den. The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, and you can imagine that at that point they put a smile on their face. It's a done deal. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. But the king's decree is the king's decree and cannot be revoked. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles, oh, I already read that. Then the, men were, uh, then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So obviously the king, the king had given it some time, hoping that the circumstances might change, but they did not. They were insistent on making sure that this man was murdered. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. That's quite a statement. A stone was brought to place over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, so he could not sleep, and, then, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the dead, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouth of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him. No wound. Because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel, the men who did what? Falsely accused Daniel was brought in and thrown into the lion's den. Alone with, along with her wives and children. Oh and before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Wow. Then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For it is the living God, for he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. And has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. 
So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Wow. Amen. Do not mess with a man of God who trusteth in the Lord. Do not mess with a woman or a man who seeks God and is truly given the title child of God. Amen? Amen. But this shows you the importance of being a man or woman separate from the rest of the world. Do not allow this culture to bring you to a place of compromise. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man shall love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is simply this. You will not have the passion, the fire for the things of God if you are sitting at the table yeah. of demons. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Amen? Yes. We need to separate ourselves. The church is to lead the culture and not the culture of the church. And currently in our situation, it's the culture that's leading the church. It's the culture that is leading people to compromise their convictions, to live a life of worldliness, and to exclude holiness and righteousness. You are a holy people. People separated for God. You are a peculiar people. That means you're strange to the world. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. I'm different. You're right. I don't talk like the world talks. I don't behave like the world behaves. And if I do, then I get down on my knees and I say, Lord, forgive me. I'm going to commit myself, Lord, to living the life you've called me to. Amen? Amen? The Lord gives grace to the humble, amen, but resists the proud. Yeah. Yeah. I am not going to hold a position where I am too proud to bow the knee and to say, Lord, I need your help. Yeah. Yeah. And I need to be so committed to God that I am a man of principle mm -hmm. and not just living off of my feelings or impulses. Mm -hmm. And if we're not there, then we've got something to shoot for. Yes, Lord. Amen? Amen? You got something to live for yeah. in terms of improving our character. God help us. Let's stand together.